sang this song before, uh, We Are One in the Spirit. I chose it on purpose, of course. <laughs> um, and we are, as a fellowship, we are also a church or part of the church, the body of Christ. And we need to operate one in the Spirit, being one in the Spirit. Um, but at the same time, in each of us, there is the flesh working. And um, which means there is opportunities for the enemy. And um, we have to be aware of this and um, guard ourselves against this. And we have the word and the instructions of the word to help us with that. And so I want to look at what um, Paul wrote to one of the early churches with regards to this and in particular the church of Colossae. Um, Colossae is one of the last churches he wrote a letter to. Um, it was when he was in prison. And it was a church the, that uh, Paul had not uh, founded himself. He had not preached there or anything. Um, it was done by Epaphras. And, um, but Paul um, got the word and I'm sure also uh, inspiration and discernment from the Spirit to, to address certain issues there. And he was very positive about his church, but at the same time he also had things to, um, to point out. And in particular it was false teaching that was uh, creeping in. Um, and the, the basic thing of the teaching was that there were other means uh, other than Christ to, to bridge the gap between man and God. That was the main thing. And that is actually, when I was thinking about it, in many cases um, it is uh, the, the basis for, for any false teaching that, that we see in, uh, in churches. Um, and it is because of the, the lack of real spirituality or the lack of a relationship with Christ that people try to grasp something and preferably something that they can see or feel or experience so that it makes, easier, makes it easier for them to relate to, to this God. And so they, uh, they had prayed to other beings, to angels and, and spirits. Uh, and they um, brought in rituals, things they could do, so they could experience something. And um, that is what Paul addresses. And uh, we will go through several of these things and I um, think they are very um, familiar actually to us as well. And the conclusion, uh, of course, is he points them back to the pure gospel. It's only through Christ. That's the only way. This relationship with Jesus. That's the only way to get to God and not all these other things. Now, before um, Paul is able to give any um, criticism, there has to be a common ground. Because um, if we have no common ground and I tell you, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, and then you become uh, aggravated. It's not uh, a nice thing. Uh, and on top of that, I would not have any uh, excuse to just um, criticize uh, someone else. But in this case, um, if we go to the letter of Colossi, Coloss Colossians, the letter to the Colossians, um, in chapter 1, This is the introduction of the letter. Verse 4, Paul says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. So there is faith in Christ Jesus. This is a common denominator. So he's not just saying this as one man to the other, but as fellow believers. That makes, of course, the whole difference. And he also talks about um, the love 
which you have to all the saints. So it's not only that you care about yourself or um, your own fellowship, but you express love to all the saints, to all the believers. And this is not human love. In verse 8 he says, talking about Jesus, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. It is the love that comes through the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, it lists these nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, and the first one is love. So this is not human love, this is not fabricated love by man, but it is a love that can only come through the Holy Spirit. So this is the common ground. There is a faith in Jesus and there is love that comes through the Holy Spirit. And that enables Paul to speak to them and to, to basically criticize them without um, them getting angry at him because of that. Now, if you see the, letter to the, Corin the letters to the Corinthians, there is also a lot of criticism because a lot of issues were going on there. Um, Basically, they had the same uh, origin, but um, they were actually more severe, I would say. And there is also um, a lack of presence of the Holy Spirit and a lack of faith in Jesus. And that's why there Paul has to explain to them why he's criticizing them and um, that it is not meant in a bad way. Now here to the Colossians, he doesn't need to explain this. They understand. He's a fellow believer and um, they understand this is, this is from God. This is from the Holy Spirit. But for example, in um, 2 Corinthians, to we'll just briefly go there, 2 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 24. So he, he gives here the reason why he is addressing them. And he says, it's not for that we have dominion over your faith, but we are helpers of your joy. For by faith you stand. See, he says, I don't want to rule over you. I don't want to tell you what to do. I want to help you for your joy. And that is the whole purpose. And of course, that is also why, why we are here and why, why God speaks to us. It is to help us in our faith, to increase our joy, and also to, of course, um, give us more weapons, so to speak, against the enemy. So that is the, um, the background, so to speak. Then, in chapter 2 of um, the letter to the Colossians, Paul starts to um, address, address them. And um, I first want to read verse 1 through 3. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comfort comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father and of Christ, in whom all are hid, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he says, I've, I've not seen you in the flesh, I've not met you ever, but I have this great, great conflict, this great uh, concern inside. And um, so it's clearly this sermon by the Holy Spirit that has put this on Paul's heart to, uh, to address this. He discerns that there is um, an attack by Satan on this church of Colossae and also he mentions at the same time the, the church of Laodicea. <coughs> um, it was uh, common uh, that these letters were passed on to different churches. They were sometimes copied and just passed on to the other church. So, um, we, we might assume, especially because he mentions it here, that this letter was also given to the church of Laodicea. Which is interesting because we find this church in um, Revelation 3. 
and of the seven churches it's the last one it's a lukewarm church and this brings it ties it into our time because that's actually a picture of our era and also of the state of the church today so this very much applies to us and uh, to our time and so uh, he says uh, basically here uh, with so many words that it's necessary to be established or better to re-establish in Christ in God the Father and in Jesus Christ and he says in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge he's actually giving his conclusion here there is where you find everything all the treasures all the knowledge it's in him you don't need anything else but of course he will make it more clear to them what what is this this uh, these other things that they are after so there are um, in this uh, chapter 2 there are four snares that he mentions four uh, ways the enemy is is um, working on this church so i will call them uh, a b c and d <laughs> So we start with the first one, A, and this is um, given in verse 4 through 7. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving so the first snare here in verse 4 is enticing words he said be careful that no man will will give you false ideas with well-sounding words and um, I'm sure we we know this um, there are so many ministries and uh, preachers and evangelists and uh, you name it that have that have beautiful words that can speak very well and are very appealing um, and they can easily deceive us, especially if we do not meet the condition that Paul gives here. Um, he says in verse 7, rooted and built up in him, in Christ, and established in the faith, as you have been taught. So, if we are not rooted in the truth, we can easily be deceived. That is the conclusion, which is, makes perfect sense, of course. If you know the truth and someone is telling a lie, you will identify the lie because you know the truth. If you don't know the truth, then uh, if the lie sounds convincing, you will accept it. It's very logic. And Paul mentions the same thing, actually, um, in um, Ephesians. I want to just read this one verse from Ephesians 5. Verse 6 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And here we have right away another, um, another item we can put on the other side of the scale. Uh, as opposed to being deceived, we have to know the truth, but we also have to obey. It's the children of disobedience that will be deceived with these vain words. The disobedience means you're not in the will of God. And if you're not in the will of God, you will follow the will of Satan, the enemy. And that will cause God's wrath to come upon you. So uh, being prone to being deceived is actually uh, it's not the deceiver that we blame for this. It's us that we have to to look at because this means we are not rooted in the truth and we are not in obedience it also if we are not rooted in the truth we cannot grow and you will see um, 
uh, I've seen it in my own life, but also see it in, in others, um, unfortunately, that they don't grow because they're not rooted in the truth. They just have some attributes of Christianity that they will use and, and, and express, but that's it. It's like you, you cut a rose from the garden and you put it in, in a vase with water, it will uh, open up, it will look beautiful, but only for so many days, and then it will wither and die, because it doesn't have roots. However, if you put a seed in the earth, it's only a seed, it's actually that thing, but it will come to life, it will grow and it will become big, because it has roots. It is able with the roots to, um, to nourish itself all the time. And, and that's, so it should it also be with our faith, it, we should be rooted. And even if we are pruned and everything, we still grow. Um, <clears throat> so, how, how um, is this expressed, this being rooted? It's in two ways. In our daily life, it is expressed um, because Jesus is our Lord, our King, has Lordship over our life. He makes the decisions for us instead of we making decisions and then maybe asking him to bless them. Um, he's the ruler, he's the king, he's in charge. That is what should drive our daily life. And our spiritual life, we find the same, but it is through the word. We feed on God's word daily and that, um, that makes us grow spiritually, that makes us understand God's will in a better way and it allows God, us to, for God to speak to us. It's one of the ways he speaks to us. So we have in our daily life, in our activities, we have the living word, Jesus, and in our spiritual life we have the written word. And as I started to say, we are as a fellowship, but even as individual believers, we are part of the body of Christ, of this larger church. And this body, of this body, Christ is the head. Um, and go back to Ephesians for a second, where this is um, literally said in Ephesians 4, verse 15 and 16. And maybe you remember we read these verses when we talked about the tabernacle where the, the walls, the, uh, the boards of the walls represent individual believers that are, are put together with bars and, and so the body is, is firmly knitted together and that is what is said here in Ephesians 4 verse 15 and 16 but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And again, the love here, it's the love that can only come through the Holy Spirit. But you see how if for every individual believer Christ is the head, then it becomes one body. It's controlled by the same head. Um, and if, if this is not the case, then it's not part of the same body. So that's really essential. But so as he is the head, he is also the root. He's also the foundation. And this we find in 1 Corinthians 3. And we also read this uh, when we talked about the tabernacle because these boards uh, of the walls, they are standing in silver sockets. And this silver was um, paid uh, as atonement, as ransom by the Israelites. And it refers back to, to the blood of Christ that has atoned us. So this is 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Very clear. I would say. So when he is the foundation and when he is the head, we are actually in between. And he is in charge of everything uh, that, we, that we do. And if anything happens, 
we just need to look to on which we stand, the rock on which we stand, our foundation, and we know that we are secure. And when, when these conditions are there, or when this condition is there, it's Jesus, God can do great things, miraculous things. But only based upon that. And this is actually the problem that was starting to grow here in the Church of Colossae, and that we see uh, on a larger scale in uh, the Church of the Corinthians, the basis was not 100% based on Christ. And therefore, they were seeking other things to get these miraculous uh, experiences that they were um, hoping for, that they wanted. And uh, Paul continues with that. So, the first snare is uh, enticing words. Enticing words. Then um, he continues in verse 8 with the second snare, verse 8 through 15. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy of and vain deceit after the tradition of man after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Again saying, Christ is the head. The head of the church, but you see also here, the fullness of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The fullness of the Godhead is expressed in Christ. This is also very important. Come back to this. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh of, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all your, your old trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, with, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Big and beautiful words here. But the beginning here in verse 8 is, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. So this is the second snare, philosophy and deceit. And again it comes through men, just like we saw before with the enticing words. It comes through man. It's Satan uses man to bring this about. So what does it mean, philosophy in vain deceit? It means that everything that is of God is being rationalized, is being explained, is being um, reasoned with the reason of man. And that means that all the supernatural, all the the, the godliness is removed. Um, f philosophy um, is, of course, a Greek word, uh, philo and um, Sophia, so it's friend of wisdom. And, but this wisdom is not God's wisdom, it's human wisdom. And this human wisdom um, leads to all kinds of ideas that um, exclude God. For example, evolution theory. It calls for a universe without God. Big Bang theory it calls for creation that happened by itself without God. This is human wisdom, human reasoning. And it makes sense because man cannot ascend above himself, so he will always go around.
around in circles and end up with things he only can explain and understand. Um, we see it also in, in um, uh, modernism or a new age, um, which has a form of spirituality because this, this yearning is there in, in every man. It's written on our hearts. We want to, to have something higher, but at the same time we want to be in control of it. So there is this form of spirituality and even a form of Christianity, but it is without Christ, it is without sin, and it is without atonement. It is actually, as you will always see, it is, uh, it is serving man instead of the other way around. This spirituality is serving man. And that is, that is Satan's deception. It's what he did right in the Garden of Eden. You will be like gods. You will have all the spirituality and you will be in control of it. You will be your own god. So this, this philosophy is very deceitful. It will always rule out God. And, and certainly rule out Christ. There, was, there is some form of godliness, yeah, as, as Paul also writes to Timothy, some form of godliness but without recognizing uh, the power thereof. Now he, Paul gives here in verse uh, 8 three reasons why this is so deceitful. He says this philosophy and this uh, vain deceit, it is, first of all, after the tradition of man. It's after the tradition of man, which means it's not after the tradition of God. Secondly, it's after the rudiments or the elements of the world. That's everything that we can see, that we can touch, that we can understand. It's after the elements of the world, which means it's not after the elements of heaven. It is in other words, it's natural, it's not supernatural. And thirdly, it is not after Christ. It is not after Christ. Or you could say it in another word, it is antichrist. And it always comes down to that any deception Satan brings is always antichrist. It's always ruling out the necessity of Christ and ruling out Jesus as the one and only way to God. Now basically he co goes on in this section that we read from verse uh, 9 until um, 15, he gives actually a very powerful testimony of, of Christ. What is Jesus? That counters all this, um, this deception. He says in verse 10, First of all, you are complete in him. In other words, you don't need anything else. He has said this before. We read it before. <clears throat> You're complete in him. So, if you have Jesus, you don't need to seek anything else. Through him, you will receive everything that you need. It's complete. That's one thing. But, and then he says, he is the head of all principality and power. Now, principalities and powers that's all the unseen, all the, the spirits, the demons, Satan himself, but also the, the good uh, spirits, the angels of God. He is head of everything. He is higher than everything. And as, as, as you also said, uh, Jacqueline, uh, he who is in us is stronger than he who is in the world. That's what it says here, of course. Uh, that's uh, uh, comforting and uh, good assurance that we need. But the word here is also interesting. He, sa he says he's the head. Now Paul knows, uh, and of course the Spirit gives him this, he, he uses this certain words for a certain reason, because we know this word head in Hebrew to be rosh. And we know from Genesis 1, as we studied it before, that in the first word of the Bible, Bereshit, is, um, is this, uh, this Reshit is, is based from the same root, Rosh. It points to Jesus. He is before all things. Uh, in all things, in him all things uh, have been made. So, um, that is again expressed here by using this word head. 
everything is made through him and for him. Then in verse 11 and 12, he brings two things to the forefront, circumcision and baptism. And it's interesting that he's doing so, because circumcision is something that the Jewish people would understand, and a baptism is something that the Gentiles would understand. He addresses both. Why? Because in Colossae there were both Jews and Gentiles. If you read Corinthians, you will read mainly about um, baptism and not about circumcision. Corinthians was a really a church um, made out of um, Gentiles or, or heathen actually. They were pagans, pagan, pagan worshippers before they became Christians. They did not have Jewish roots in their church. So you see that Paul uses a different angle there to address them. And here he has to bring up both. But he also basically equates these two, circumcision and baptism. Because he says in both, it is, uh, in verse 11, talking about circumcision, it is putting off the body of sins, of the flesh, by the circumcision in Christ. So he, he explains this also to the Romans, in the letter to the Romans, it's not the, the physical circumcision of the flesh, it's the circumcision of the heart. That is what makes a difference. And actually, you can read it in, in Moses as well. It's not, nothing new. Um, and by that you put off the body of sins. You bring an end to the old nature, the old life. And in verse 12 when he talks about baptism, he says actually the same. You're buried with baptism. This is the death of the old person. But then you're also risen. When you ascend from the water, you are a new person. You are risen with him. as Jesus rose from the dead. So there is the separation of the old man and the new man, of the old life and the new life. And it, again, it comes only through Christ, only through Him. And then verse 14, I just want to mention, because this is often misquoted. You often hear, hear people say that the law was nailed to the cross. And it's based upon this verse, and it's not what it says. When we read here, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. It's basically, in modern terms, you could say the criminal verdict, the criminal record and the verdict against us, that has been nailed to the cross. Not the law. The law still stands. Matthew 5, uh, in Matthew 5, Jesus clearly... Um, explains this. The law still stands. It uh, doesn't change. But because of the law, we are uh, sentenced to death. Uh, and that, that verdict, that is nailed to the cross. He paid for that. So philosophy and vain deceit was the second snare, or uh, B. C then is in verse 16 and 17, and that is with one word, it's ritualism. Verse 15 and 16, it says, uh, sorry, 16 and 17. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So what does this mean? Again, let no man, it comes through man. You've seen it every time again. Let no man um, <clears throat> judge you because of what you eat or drink. Why was this? Because of the, the Jewish uh, factor there in the church, they wanted to go back to the Jewish law, the Jewish tradition, the kosher food, uh, and all the things that, that they had, even the, those that were non-Jewish. And they were starting to judge each other for that. If you would not eat kosher, something was wrong. You had to do these things. Uh, so this, it's what they ate and drank, but it also says in respect of any holy day. And ho holy day, it is the feast days of the Lord. It's Leviticus 23. So they were 
pressing each other to keep those holy days the way they were done since Moses' times. Uh, and also the new moon. Uh, the new moon we know it witnesses God's clock for the months and for the feast days. Or the Sabbath days. Same thing for the Sabbath. The Sabbath laws, the Sabbath walk, all these things that uh, the, were very strict in the Jewish tradition. Um, they were trying to, to grab onto this, to keep th these things. Why? Again, as I said before, it's because this was tangible. These were things you could do and you could testify of it. I have done my, my part. I have kept the feast days. I have kept um, the Sabbath and I have uh, not uh, eaten or drink, drank anything that was not kosher. But then he says, uh, Paul says, no, let no one judge you for that. And he explains in verse 17 why. Because he doesn't say that these things are bad in itself, but if they become the test to see if we are correct believers, then it's wrong. He says, because they, these things, are a shadow of things to come. Now, as we have studied many things, we, this is what we have seen. All these feasts, all these traditions, they are a picture of what was to come. So it's vital, actually, for our understanding of of scripture or of the things that Jesus has done that we understand those feasts and the meaning of it and all these things so it's good to read them and to study them it's also what Paul writes to Timothy you stay with with the things that you have learned from old the scriptures referring to of course Old Testament there was no New Testament but they are a shadow of things to come and these things have come so now you focus on that which forecasted the shadow, which is Christ. It's like when, um, when you stand in a, in a street and there is a corner and you see a shadow, you know something is going to come around the corner. The shadow gets your attention. And from the shape of the shadow you can already see what it is. Or, who, or that it's a person, for example. But once the person comes around the corner, you forget about the shadow, now the person is there. So the shadow, that's what it actually literally means. It's a foreshadow, a shadow of things to come. But it has come now. So now the focus should be on Christ and not on these things. They help, yes, they help to understand the, the depth of what Christ has fulfilled and, and how God has, has worked and, and will be working because not everything has been fulfilled. But but they are not the focus of our faith. So rituals and customs cannot elevate us above what it's really about. It cannot do anything actually. If we stick to them and as they were doing, actually you, you call up judgment upon yourself because you will prove that you are unable to, to do all these things. You will fail as... as the Jews knew, because this was what was happening for thousands of years. This is why they had to all the time bring the sacrifices, because they were failing all the time. It's impossible to keep the law. And so that's why there is a verdict against us. And that's what was nailed to the cross. And so that's what is called ritualism. Keeping rituals, sticking to rituals. Why should we stick to the shadow if we have the light? We have to come out of the shadow and live in the light. Now, in our times, there are many other rituals that are non-Judaic, but they are just the same. And actually, as I mentioned before, we see them also in the church of the Corinthians. There were many rituals that were non-Judaic, but they did the same thing. They brought in rituals that they knew from their pagan history. And they, kept, they tried to incorporate that and focused on those things. Because it was much easier than to focus on Christ. It's much easier to, to do these, these tangible things. And so we have, we have them... Today, the same thing. We see um, 
attributes or rituals, if you will, from Eastern religions, uh, mainly through New Age, creeping into Christianity. Um, things like, like contemplative prayer, like visualization, uh, like uh, Mandela drawing, which is done in many churches, um, yoga or quote-unquote Christian yoga. These things, it is just bringing in rituals um, and focus on them. Because these are things you can do, and they can fulfill, to a certain extent, that which is, is lacking. The spiritual gap that is there is being filled with these kind of thing, things. So it's an attempt to feel more spiritual. Through rituals, one will feel more spiritual, and it's, 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 it's non-Christian, uh, so to speak. That's why you find it everywhere outside Christianity whether it's in occultism or in, in other religions, um, you find rituals. Everywhere you find rituals. With incense, with candles, with uh, meditation, you name it. There are all kinds of rituals that um, are attempts for people to, to feel more spiritual. And all of them are instead of Christ. It's always anti-Christ, these things. So if we focus on Christ, we don't need any of this. So that's ritualism, C, the third um, snare. And the uh, fourth, or D, the last one in this list, is what you could call superstition. That is in verse 18 and 19. It begins the same way. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, with the capital H, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, Increase it with the increase of God. So this is actually a big trap. Because as it's our nature, it's our fleshly nature, to want to know that which is unknown. To want to see that which is unseen. We have this, this urge. We want, we want this. And... This, this uh, type of curiosity, you could say, it's actually beneficiary for us because it makes us uh, search after things and research things and that makes us grow. But of course, if we search in the wrong direction or if it is fed with uh, these deceptive uh, ideas, it's also a big danger. And that is what uh, Paul addresses here. Um, he says the worshipping of angels. Now, you can take it literal, worshipping of angels, uh, angels of God. We know several of them actually by name from the Bible, like Gabriel, like Michael. Um, these are angels that we know. And exactly these angels you will find in New Age uh, teachings. There is many um, channeling of information allegedly from these angels. They use the same name, names. Angel Gabriel, Angel Michael, um, and, and some others. So that's worshiping of angels. That's 100% against God's word. Um, but you can take the word angels also a bit wider. It's actually spiritual beings. So any spiritual being, um, that, that is being worshipped, it's against God. So, of course, in the, in the occult realm, it's, it's demons eh, that are being worshipped and that are being invoked. It's, but it's the same thing. It's worshipping angels. Whether they're fallen angels or God's angels, it is a sin, nevertheless. But also the spirits of dead people. Uh, these are also spiritual 
beings, if you will. Actually, in reality, they are demons. And often these, it's not so obvious as the examples that I give now, because you find it actually a lot in Christianity. Why? Because they mistake this with the Holy Spirit. So many Christians might think they connect with God through the Holy Spirit, uh, but they actually, in reality, they are worshipping an angel. There is no mention throughout all scripture of connecting to God through the Holy Spirit. It's only through Jesus. So if we start to address the Holy Spirit direct and, and use the Holy Spirit as a way to get to God, we are in violation with what God has told us and what Jesus has told us when he said, I am the only way. And, and it's very easy, if we, if we would do that, it's very easy for Satan to, um, to bring in a, a demon that um, acts as, as the Holy Spirit, that gives us a spiritual feeling, that gives us feedback, that makes things happen, actually. Uh, and, and, but it's not, it's not the Holy Spirit. Then he says, um, introducing into those things which he had not seen. What does this mean? Things you have not seen are, I mean seen with the eyes, are visions and dreams, bringing those things. All this, these are all things that God can, can do and give, but when we start to focus on them, when we start to, and I use this word on purpose, when we start to invoke them, chances are very big, they're not from God. And thirdly, he mentions also voluntary humility. This is self-denial or self-sacrifice. And it's, it's again trying to show, I, um, I can do this, I can bring this about, instead of um, looking at the sacrifice of Christ. It's false humility. But you could easily extend this list with anything quote-unquote spiritual that is, that is invoked by the, by, by the person, um, him or herself, uh, like, like prophecies, like healings, like expressions in tongues. If we invoke them, if we call them, it's not God giving them, it's us drawing them into our, our realm. It's very easy for Satan to step in and use that channel that we open. That is why Paul says here, and not holding the head. If we stick to the head, to Christ, he will give. He will make it happen if it suits him. If it suits God, he will give. Um, I, I think I said this before, it's God who is the giver. And it's the giver who decides when he gives, what he gives, and to who he gives. It's not the receiver that decides what to get and when to get it. That's the other way around. Then, uh, it's, if this happens, we are controlling God. We are actually ordering God, I want this now. And that's, um, and that's actually sin, because he is Lord. He is in control, and not we. It's actually pride of the heart if we start invoking. And it's really an opportunity Satan will not let go by. Now I'm going to say something you might not agree with, but I would say think about it. Any spirit can be invoked. Any spirit can be invoked. Even the Holy Spirit. To invoke make basically means to call into presence, to call in from the spiritual realm into our realm, to manifest itself in whatever way. That is invoking a spirit. In occultism, again, it's a very common thing. You do rituals to invoke a spirit, and the spirit will come, because Satan wants this. <laughs> These are all demonic spirits, obviously. The spirit will come and, and do whatever... Um, you want it to do as long as in the end, the end game will serve, of course, only Satan's purpose. But we can also invoke the Holy Spirit. And 
if we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will come and manifest itself. Now, again, if we do this, it's, it's not correct because it's not up to us to do this. It is up to the giver to decide when and where and how. But we can do it and it can be very powerful but it's no guarantee, it's no, as, as here it says in verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward. So it's used as a reward, it's used to show I'm spiritual, God is with me. This is a reward that God gives. And that is, that is not true. Um, and I want to read from Matthew 7. It's actually the most clear scripture on this, spoken by Jesus himself, where he explains, he explains this. And um, what Jesus says there is exactly what Paul is saying. That we have to, to stick to the head. We have, it always has to be Jesus. If not, yes, there will be manifestations of the Spirit. Yes, there will be miracles. But still, the one who's invoking them is in sin. God can still do his work, of course. God can use every, anything. But the one who is doing this is doing it with the pride of his heart. And therefore, he's in sin. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. He says that not everyone said unto me, that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Key here, the obedience again. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have we cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity. So he's, Jesus starts here by saying, only if you do the will of my Father, then you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Which means faith in obedience. And then he says, many will there be that say, Lord, Lord, have we not? prophesied, cast out devils, done many wonderful works. So they have actually really done this in Jesus' name with the help of the Holy Spirit. They have indeed prophesied true prophecies. They have indeed cast out devils for real. And they have done many wonderful works. So these, these manifestations of the Holy Spirit are real. But they have done it with the wrong incentive. So God has worked nevertheless and God has and he's uh, reaching out to people, touching people, uh, drawing in people through these um, manifestations. But there is not, it's no guarantee that the one who, and I use the word intentionally again, who invokes it, that he is saved in the end. If, if this is all pride and he's not living in obedience, then this will happen. Jesus will say, he will call them workers of iniquity. And that's why I said before, any spirit can be invoked, even the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is not saying that this, these, these um, prophecies or uh, works were unreal. He is talking about the person calling for them, invoking them. And why does he call them works of iniquity? Yes, first of all, because they do not keep the will of the Father. And secondly, I never knew you. And we know from the Greek, it means I did not have a relationship with you, or you did not have a relationship with me. So it's this living relationship with Jesus. That should be the basis. And what does Jesus say in John uh, 14? If you keep my Father's commandments. It's the same we say, he says here. Do the will of my Father. If you keep my Father's commandments, and you believe in me, then I will pray to the Father. And he will send the Comforter even the spirit of truth. So this spirit
can only be received in this order. First live in obedience, then accept Jesus as the Redeemer, then you will receive the Holy Spirit. This is key. And so, that's why Paul says in to the letter to the Colossians, um, let no one man beguile you, um, tempt you with rewards based on these things. Because you might be able to, to do these things, but this does not guarantee your reward. Your reward is based on the relationship with Jesus. That's what he says in verse 18. Uh, so verse 19, hold to the head. It's this head, the head and the foundation. That has to be correct. And then um, anything, anything is possible. But um, any other link to God, even the Holy Spirit and its gifts, um, denies the union with Christ. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life, there's no other way to the Father than through me, this is very, very heavy. And, but, but also, um, it's basic to, to our faith. That is where, where it stands on. It means only through Jesus. And it excludes everything else. And maybe I stick on this a while, but I think it's important because uh, I've, I've seen this, and especially, of course, in, in charismatic circles, there is a lot of focus on the Holy Spirit. But the focus should be on Jesus and not on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is something we receive that will, will help us and support us and make it possible for us in our flesh to, to be dedicated and devoted to God and to, to, to have our uh, daily walk in this world. Um, but the focus is, is Jesus. That's the relationship. Remember, I just called up this, this picture when we talked in the tabernacle about the altar of incense, which is the last item before the veil, before access to God, before the, the, um, the ark. That stands for prayer. The prayer is our communication to God. The altar is actually a picture of Jesus. Not of the Holy Spirit, it's Jesus, again, with the horns of salvation, um, we saw that these four attributes that the incense had had to do with, um, with the attributes of Jesus. Um, and it's only in his name that we can actually get access to God. However, there is this crown around the altar that prevents the, the coal, the fire, from falling outside. And it's the fire that comes from the uh, altar of burnt offering. Only that fire is accepted. The fire is the Holy Spirit. And so how does the fire, it comes from the altar of burnt offering, which is a picture of the cross. So it's first accepting you're a sinner, um, repent, confessing and repenting, and then through this, through the cross, you will receive the spirit, the fire. And the fire goes inside the tabernacle. It lights the menorah, it also lights the altar of incense. And that enables the incense, the prayer, to go up. So it is powered, if you will, by the Holy Spirit, but it is through Jesus. Here is as the altar of incense, but also as uh, the Savior on the cross, which is the altar of burnt offering that brings the fire in here. Uh, through him you receive the Spirit, and then things become possible, not the other way around. And uh, also, uh, just to bring this here in perspective, this, this picture I made here in this book, it also shows that we, ha we are flesh and a spirit of life that, that animates our flesh. That's, that's the flesh. But our flesh is purpose to serve God. It's, it keeps our soul and it's purpose to serve God. And it's the Holy Spirit that makes this possible. Our own spirit only serves the flesh. Only, it's only for animation. To make us alive but it cannot it's too weak to serve God so we need the Holy Spirit that is that is the, pur the main purpose of the Holy Spirit it makes it possible for us to serve God whilst in the flesh and and all the other things that God can do through the Spirit 
it's extra, so to speak. That's why they are called gifts. Gifts are extra. And they, they, God gives them when they are necessary and when they serve His purpose at a certain time. And <clears throat> indeed, through the Holy Spirit, God can do, can do majestic things. Um, <clears throat> this is um, beautifully um, mentioned by uh, Isaiah in chapter 64, verse 4. And we know this verse, but usually from another context. And interesting, remember, this is written in Hebrew. It says, for since the beginning of the world, what is the beginning of the world? It points to Genesis 1, verse 1. But the beginning, <clears throat> again, it's Rosh. So it's directly linked to Jesus, what he's saying here. <clears throat> since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he had prepared for him that waiteth for him. And we know the verse most likely from 1 Corinthians 2, where it's quoted. And there, it's in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, but in verse 10, Paul explains it is through the Holy Spirit that God makes this possible. Because no ear has heard, no eye has seen, this is the flesh, this is the physical. It's impossible for the physical to see these things, to perceive them. But through the Spirit, we get access to, to the depths of God. But only God Himself, through the Holy Spirit, can reveal. So it says here, for him that waited for him, in 1 Corinthians, is for him that loves God. And so th that is exactly the same that Jesus says. If you, if you love if you keep the commandments of my Father, in other words, if you love the Father and you believe in me, then you will receive the Holy Spirit. And then the impossible becomes possible and the unseen becomes seen. And, and so that ties in with um, what Paul writes here to the Colossians because he, he says you, you, you have the superstition. You want to, to see these unseen things. You want to know the unknown things. And you try to get to them the wrong way. You try to get to them with a shortcut, going directly into some form of spirituality, but that will lead to destruction. You have to stick to the head. Through Christ, you will receive what you need. So, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to the Father which he says himself in John 14, verse 6. But he is also the only mediator, which is said in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. This is also important. That is why, that is why again, I brought this picture of the altar of incense. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. No other name, not through um, saints or through Maria or all these kind of ideas. It's in Jesus' name. And it is because the Holy Spirit indwells us, it is possible. That's why we pray either to the Father or to Jesus directly, since He is our mediator. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. There is no mentioning in the Bible ever of this happening. And it happens a lot in... Um, in Christianity or in especially in charismatic uh, form of Christianity it is actually unbiblical and it's it gets the danger of worshiping angels spiritual beings even though it's the Holy Spirit it's still it's not uh, the way that God has instructed it and it becomes very clear when the disciples ask Jesus teach us how to pray he gives a prayer and it's clearly shows all the attributes that a prayer should have and it does not have any anything else than talking to the Father in Jesus name as he says if you do this in my name so to conclude this he gives four um, four snares verse 4 the enticing words 
in verse 8, philosophy and vain deceit. Um, in verse 16, uh, ritualism, rituals, customs. And then in verse 18, um, superstition in general. Uh, worshipping spirits and uh, false humility. Going, yeah, spiritualism, you could say, false spiritualism, maybe. Also, clinging on to visions and dreams and invoking all these things. He also gives, in many ways, by the way, but I will pick out three, he gives um, what we should do. So these are things we should be aware of or not do, but he also what you should yet we've I've said it actually many times, it's all the time it's Christ, it's Jesus only. So he says in verse six, um, you have received Christ, walk in him. So that is a clear instruction, walk in Christ. Walk in the ways that he has shown. And in verse nine, verse nine and ten actually. He says, everything, the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus. And so, in verse 10, he says, you are complete in him. You don't need anything else. You don't need any rituals, any special things, no tricks, nothing. You're complete in him. Just focus on him. That's all you need to do. And, and then he will, through him, great things will happen and this, this thought came to me that's also why I had this first from Ezra um, earlier God wants to do great things also here among us but it can only be through Jesus and so that has to be the, our focus and nothing else we we uh, here, but in general as Christians, we should not try to to go and do things because we we think we need to do things. We, we need to do one thing: focus on Jesus. And if we really do that, and we walk in the will of God, uh, as we read in Matthew seven, He will show us what to do, and He will open the doors, and He will give all the tools and the things that we need to do it. But that should be the focus. And um, in verse 19, um, finally, uh, he says uh, that it's, it's the head. He holds the whole body together. That's why if every member of the body focuses on him, automatically everything is joined together. It's again, like these, these panels in the wall of the tabernacle. It's these bars that run all the way through them. They connect every, every single panel. So in the body, it's the head that joins everything together. And then he says also uh, that the, all of the body, all members of the body, find nourishment in him. So there is also comfort. There is, again, safety. That's what his name Yeshua means. There is safety and nourishment. And we don't need anything else. Actually, anything else is a sin. Anything else is a sin. That, that is actually the thing. In verse 19. Have, so, um, all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. So, that he will increase with the increase of God. And, and then things will happen beyond what we can imagine or do on our own merit. In Yeshua's name, Amen. Amen.